Welcome to a Legendarium special about Alexander Selkirk, the real-life Robinson Crusoe. In this episode, we will talk about a mariner who spent four years alone on a deserted island and inspired one of the world's most beloved literary classics. Alexander Selkirk, sometimes spelled Sel Craig, came into the world in Scotland during the year 1676. He came of age in Lower Largo, a fishing village with fewer than 1,000 inhabitants across the Firth of Forth from bustling Edinburgh, a city of 30,000 people. The son of a shoemaker, he had six brothers. Alexander's family had enough wealth to provide him with a basic education. His first appearance in historical records is that a court found young Selkirk guilty of indecent behavior in, of all places, a church, on August 25th, 1695. Rather than face the angry church elders, the reckless teenager went to sea. Later, he beat up his father and two of his brothers over a harmless prank, and left both the women who claimed to be his wife. Perhaps encouraged by angry neighbors, Selkirk went to sea and became an officer thanks to his skill in mathematics and navigation. In 1703, he joined the fateful privateering expedition of William Dampierre, destined for adventure in the Pacific Ocean. As privateers, they had a letter of mark from the British government to seize Spanish ships for Britain had gone to war with Spain. Sailing off the coast of Spanish-ruled Chile in the summer of 1704, the Dampier expedition reached the Juan Fernandez Islands, 400 miles from the coast. The expedition included two ships, the HMS St. George, captained by William Dampierre, and the HMS St. Ports, captained by Thomas Stradling. The original captain of the St. Ports died mid-voyage, and so Stradling earned promotion while Selkirk became master, or second in command. Stradling proved to be a less than talented commander, and his strict discipline did not endear him to the crew. Matters became worse when William Dampier failed to take many Spanish ships and then failed in an attack on the fortified Spanish port of Santa Maria. Men will endure much on the job, but going unpaid is not one of them. Even worse, the HMS Sink port suffered damage during the failed attack, and Captain Stradling took her ashore for repairs. Selkirk argued with Stradling, insisting that the new caulking would leak and endanger the ship. When Captain Stradling ordered her to sail anyway, Selkirk refused to follow orders, and so Stradling left him on the island in October 1704. Selkirk expected the crew to join him, and when they did not, Selkirk begged the captain to forgive him. The captain did not and left Selkirk marooned. Typically, marooning served as a death sentence used to punish mutineers. Many such men begged for the quick death of a bullet, and some captains left them a pistol with one shot so they could end their own lives when thirst became too much. Instead, Selkirk's captain left him a chest that contained many useful pieces of equipment for life on an uninhabited island. These included clothes, bedding, a musket with powder and bullets, tobacco, a hatchet, a Bible, and some mathematical instruments and books. With that and nothing else, Captain Stradling left Selkirk on the island. Selkirk's island, known today as Isla Robinson Crusoe, formerly Isla Mas a Tierra, is crescent-shaped. It includes a long, thin peninsula at the western end and mountains in the center. Heavily forested, the island provided Selkirk with timber, fresh spring water, and meat from goats, seals, and sea lions. Selkirk also found wild plums and herbs and turnips planted by sailors on previous sojourns. In the tropical climate, Selkirk's clothes soon disintegrated, and he made new ones using goat skin sewn together with a needle that he made from a nail. 
By rubbing sticks of pimento wood together, Selkirk made his own fire. He even built two shelters from branches and long grass, and furnished these with more goat skins. Ever resourceful, Selkirk tamed many of the island's wild cats to keep his shelter free from rats and give himself company during those long, lonely days. His, felt, his faith helped him to keep his sanity as he read through the Bible and sang hymns. Selkirk likely submitted to Captain Stradling's sentence of marooning because he knew the islands to be used by pirates and privateers who might rescue him in time. However, four long years passed before he ever laid eyes on another human being. On February 2nd, 1709, Woods Rogers rescued Selkirk from the Juan Fernandez Islands. Despite being in fine physical shape, Selkirk lost his powers of speech by the time that Rogers rescued him. When he regained his power of speech, Selkirk told Rogers that he sighted only a few ships over the years and none saw his signal fires. Two ships anchored at the islands, but these turned out to be Spanish ships and they shot at Selkirk, requiring him to disappear into the forest. On the ship, Selkirk met his old commander, William Dampierre, who advised Rogers to take Selkirk on as an officer. While on board, Selkirk learned that the HMS sink ports, under Stradling's fine leadership, had leaked and sunk just like Selkirk predicted. By choosing the island, Selkirk saved his life. The privateering expedition continued and made a remarkable capture, the Nuestra Señora de la Encarnación, a Manila galleon loaded with Chinese goods. Selkirk received a share of it in the amount of 800 British pounds, making his tale a true rags-to-riches story. Following his return to Britain in October 1711, after an eight-year absence from his homeland, Selkirk lived off his prize money for several years. In 1717, he became an officer in the Royal Navy and died at sea in 1721 from tropical fever. He said during his later years that he always wished himself back on his desert island. Selkirk's life inspired Daniel Defoe's novel Robinson Crusoe, first published in 1719, about ten years after Selkirk's rescue, and is considered to be the first novel in the English language. Defoe took a great interest in maritime history, especially the lives of privateers and pirates. Though Defoe never met Selkirk, he knew several men involved in his life. The book became an instant classic and has become one of those rare novels much loved by literary critics and general readers. It also ensured the survival of Alexander Selkirk's extraordinary story. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.